like Emperor Nero brought the most powerful of them all, the Roman Empire, on its knees, they say that it was burning at his watch. And guess what? <laughs> I feel like the earth is burning at our watch. And that feeling, I think, must have inspired me, really, to make the outcome of the Age of Nero as dark as it is. believe that you know that um, a black metal band or any kind of metal band really has, has done something as uh, like the Age of Nero, which is a very you know, I don't know. It's a, it's a very dramatic and powerful record, but it's but it's rooted in in reality, which is not something that heavy metal specialises in generally. We you know heavy metal is about fantasy or it's about you know escapism and all the rest of it, and this is almost like the opposite. <laughs> is very aware of their talents, which is why they find it so easy to collaborate with other artists. They're a band that's always going to be held in high regard and in high esteem. The band have a story, that they have this concept that they of global warming, of understanding human emotions and human nature, that they're almost more desperate to convey than their musicianship. <laughs> that I keep on having about living I mean narrow means black in Latin Italian and so this this reoccurring thoughts that I've had for for the last uh, couple of years or something like that about really feeling like living in the beginning of the end and then starting thinking about how my ver my world view is like and where it comes from and and starting analyzing my reactions to like all the warfare, the earthquakes, the tsunamis, the, the, the floodings, uh, famine and starvation, starvation and cultural conflicts and religious conflicts and uh, melting of the ice in the Arctic and all these things. And it's like, I'm thinking, it's a very dark and sinister feeling. The Age of Nero is the first time I've ever spoken to, to Satir and heard him say, you know, this album is about this, specifically, you know, and, and apocalyptic visions are very, very common in, in metal, as they are in, in literature and, and art and all, all kinds of things. But for a band like Satyricon to actually have, you know, the, nailing this album to that particular concept in such a, in such a, um, a blatant and outward way was quite startling, really. The other way to be pejorative about it, you would say, is that it's all marketing. <laughs> and it sells an image of oneself that people want to buy. They like that. You know, the, there's nothing more kind of sexy than a, a Boronic figure or, you know, that famous Caspar David Friedrich picture, uh, picture coming out of the woods and into the opening, into the clearing. They so say you are, you are constructing oneself as something like that, which is sexy. Like, this is no joke and it's very, very real. And I think we're a little bit, it's a little bit late to have conferences where we sit and this is very uh, worrying uh, you know <laughs> the race is on and uh, we are moving 
quickly towards the end, quickly in terms of how long we've been on this planet. Human nature hasn't changed and we're the cause of these problems. So while it's okay for him as a songwriter to condemn this and to take inspiration from this and to draw from this, there's the element of sadness in which he understands that in some way that he's a product of the, what has happened. He was saying that, you know, um, we were talking about how people say they've got a dark side, you know, and he says, and says, not everyone's got this. He said, but there's, there is a darkness inside of me and uh, I'm aware of it. And, and it's, it's integral to what I do creatively. But They express the idea that without darkness, you cannot have lightness. At the same time, you cannot have lightness without darkness. You need that point of contrast. He doesn't sing about Satan. He doesn't sing about, you know, and being evil or any of those things. It's, it's a more, um, it's a grittier and more realistic and, and I think convincing and believable. It occupies the space that, in which you can enjoy the free sound of anticipation of doom as well as, um, disclose it as well as, you know, uh, say the doom is coming. So it's up to the listener then to go, oh my God, we've got to do something about that or else or else you can go, oh great, look forward to that then. <laughs> Blackmail in the past, because of the kind of the nihilism and the we hate everything and, and you know, trying to, trying to you know, people be claiming to be Nazis and all this other stuff that went on in Norway when they were teenagers and a bit stupid, frankly, and showing off in front of their friends, you know, and who could be the most evil. Um, I think people, a lot of bands still kind of think that's what blackmail is all about. And in its purest form, I don't think it is. I think that's, you know... That's the same as you know. That's the same as any, any genre of music where people try to be outrageous and controversial. It gets boring very quickly, you know. First time I heard Black Crow on Tombstone, the song wasn't really finished. Uh, it was an unfinished version of it, but uh, still. I immediately liked it a lot. Because he wrote, he wrote the, the songs for this album um, up in the mountains. Total isolation, so, you know, surrounded by snow and very much kind of living in a, in a kind of primitive, primitive way, you know. And There's not so much a going back to anything uh, uh, in the sense of um, satirical or satire working in the woods or the forest, other than uh, a kind of a nourishing of, of, of a certain type of romantic idea, I think. He went out to a cabin in the woods and he was working on this material that we have recorded. And uh, then he presents this song to me and it sounds so different than what we had been working on during the jam. Uh, there was this uh, crow that landed uh, on a tombstone as I was watching and I was, I was paying attention to it. And it kept turning around looking at me through the window and I was going, what? <laughs> People do describe him as arrogant, you know, and I think that's because, well, he's arrogant actually, but in, a, in quite, a, quite a cool way really, because it's, it's because he's, he's so sure about what he's doing. Peculiar in a way, but then he comes from Norway, you know, and if you're surrounded by that, that, you know, amazing landscape and that kind of verdant countryside and the, you know, the, the mountains and all the rest of it. Um, I think people who live in that kind of environment must have a much stronger sense of a much stronger connection with nature and the planet in its unruined state than those of us that live in cities and, and don't get to see the countryside very often do. You know, we're surrounded by filth and cars and, you know, shit and violence and people shouting and, you know, everything else all the time. And I think there's two sides to Satyricon. There's the, there's the intellectual side, there's the, the, the artistic, the pure artistic expression of Satir's vision and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Which is what makes it special, but then there is also a kick-ass rock and roll heavy metal band as well. They sound like Motorhead, but from hell, you know. And that's what, that's what Satyricon are, you know, they're Motorhead from hell, that's brilliant, you know. <laughs> <laughs> 